that, please. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by forwarding a copy to the Courier News Star Ledger and posting on the township website at least 48 hours prior to the meeting, all in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act. This meeting was contained on a list of meetings set by resolution dated January 5, 2021. This meeting will not substantially go past 1030. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Mrs. Brahimai? Here. Mr. Kudo? Here. Mrs. Kingsley? Here. Mr. Medeiros? Here. Mr. Varnerin? Here. Mr. Yellen? Here. Mayor Devani? Here. Would you all please stand for the pledge? Aye. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, United States of America, America. and to the republic, republic, republic which is one nation, one nation under, under God, 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 visible, visible liberty, 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 justice for all. Okay, before we get into the conference session, I'm just going to ask everyone for a moment of silence uh, for the 13 soldiers uh, killed in Afghanistan, as well as the 27 New Jerseyans who lost their life in uh, the Ida. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, on to conference session, uh, we have Bill Swisher here from Supley Clooney, who is going to give us the uh, bullet points or the highlights of the 2020 annual audit. With that, Bill, will you take it away? Sure. Um, uh, first thing I want to just touch on, that uh, Eugenie asked me to touch on, is later on in the meeting, there's going to be a resolution canceling old grants, receivables, and reserves. Uh, just to let you know what that is, is when a town gets a grant uh, award, you have to set up a receivable and all the reserve, the reserves to spend the money and the receivables to collect it. Uh, and once the grants run, run, run their courses, uh, whatever is left over receivable wise and reserve wise stays in the books until you guys pass a resolution to cancel it off. So all these grants, re receivables and reserves that are on here are grants that are over and done with. Uh, so this is just cleaning up, cleaning them up off the books. Um, as for the audit, uh, each year you guys are required by the state of New Jersey to have an audit done by a registered municipal accountant. And then once that audit is completed, uh, the council is required to pass a resolution certifying that they've reviewed uh, at a minimum, the auditor's opinion of any single audit findings and any comments and recommendations. Uh, this year, uh, the auditor's opinion on a regulatory basis was an unmodified opinion. And that's basically a clean opinion. That means your financial statements are fairly stated. So that's the best opinion you can get. Uh, uh, there was no single audit this year. Uh, single audit is if you spend more than $750,000 of federal money or $750,000 of state money, you can go over either one of those thresholds. So there's no single audit this year. Uh, and then the last uh, one that you have to review is your comments and recommendations. Uh, this, this past year, we did have one comment and recommendation. I just want to read over the comment and recommendation, go through it. And if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, it deals with purchasing. Uh, and the comment reads, uh, we noted several purchase orders that were processed as confirming orders. This is where goods have been received or services have been rendered prior to the issuance of a purchase order. And the recommendation is that the practice of issuing confirming orders uh, be discontinued. Basically what a confirming order is, is that uh, somebody in the town is going out and ordering goods or services, you're going out and buying something or asking somebody to do something without running it past the finance office first, where normally Eugenia would, you know, review, would review the purchase order along with uh, Liza and they would set up a, a purchase order. Uh, the state of New Jersey has a, a specific compliance requirement that all New Jersey municipalities have to, have to adhere to. And the reason being is they don't want you guys to overspend any budget or any trust line or any capital line. And if you if you maintain your encumbrance accounting system, you're never gonna do that. If you have confirming orders, no one is checking to see whether the money is truly there to spend or not. Uh, so that, that's why the control is in place. There was no lines over expense this year. So it was nothing, no problems like that, but it's a specific uh, control that the state of New Jersey requires every town to, to maintain. And we noticed when we were doing our vouchers, there's a few orders where goods and services were ordered before uh, the finance office actually set up a purchase order uh, on the system. Um, so that, that was the only common recommendation we had. Uh, financially, uh, the township is uh, once again in good shape. Uh, we started the year out with a surplus of $2,496,000, and we ended the year with a surplus of $3,893,000. Uh, so basically, your surplus went up by uh, $1.3 million, almost $1.4 million. Uh, in, in the year of COVID, uh, a lot of towns were very nervous about, you know, how are they going to do financially, and uh, Berkeley Heights fared very well. Uh, one of the one of the main drivers as to why you guys did well was your uh, was your tax collection rate. 
uh, your, your rate actually went up from 98.77 to 98.85. Everybody's very concerned with the COVID as to whether people are gonna be able to be, pay their taxes and whether businesses will be able to pay their taxes, your collection rate actually went up uh, and, and therefore your surplus also went up. Um, so overall with the uh, uh, clean opinion is what you want. You had one common recommendation, recommendation which, I would, which I would just call minor. It's uh, strictly a compliance issue and financially the, uh, the township is in good shape. Uh, and that's why you said you guys, uh, I think have a bond rating of AA1, uh, which, which is good. And it, it shows that you guys have been building your surplus uh, over the last three years. Your surplus have, has increased from 1.8 million in 18, 2.4 in 19, and uh, now up to 3.8 million in, in 20. So financially you guys are in good shape also. Uh, that's all I have. Is there any specific questions anybody had? I know that Jean Liza and I had the benefit of uh, speaking to you uh, with Eugenia a few weeks ago. So does anyone, I mean, Jean, if you have another question, that's fine, okay. but um, does anybody, I know this is your lane. Um, does anybody else have any questions? No. All right, outstanding. Thank you, Bill. We appreciate the, uh, yes, the information you. and you coming here tonight. Thank you very much. Good Thank night. you. Well, Thank you, Bill. Okay, on to the regular agenda, and the uh, next item is the approval of the minutes. Yes, I move to uh, move that the minutes of the regular meeting of the Township Council held on August 17th, 2021, mm -hmm. as distributed, be accepted and approved. Seconded. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai. Stain. Mr. Kudo. Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Barnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. Uh, I move to open the hearing on agenda items only. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Barnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. The hearing is now open on agenda items only. I'm gonna read the instructions uh, for the entire meeting. <clears throat> All residents will remain muted and their videos off until the appropriate time for public participation. Each resident will get two three minute opportunities to speak once during the hearing on the agenda items and again at the end of the meeting during the citizens hearing. There will also be certain meetings at which residents can speak and ask questions during the conference session. People can request to address the council at any time by putting your name and address in the chat box to the right of your screen or by using the raise your hand option in Zoom. The host Liza will see these requests and calling you during the, during the public comment periods. Now, when each resident speaks, he or she will have his video turned on by the council moderator. Video will be turned back off after the resident is done speaking. Council will respond only when the resident is completely finished with their questions and back on mute. This is to ensure each person who wants to ask a question gets a chance to and will avoid people talking over each other so everyone is clearly heard. Reminder, all participants with the exception of council will be on audio only and will be muted until the end of the public comment period. Okay, with that, Liza. Okay, first I'm going to toss it to uh, Anna, our clerk, because she has a comment that was sent in. Okay, okay this is from uh, Tamara Zanko. Um, she, hello, I'm in support of the ordinance for creating cannabis free zones in Berkeley Heights schools, parks, and other public places that Councilman Stephen Yellen is proposing. It seems obvious to me that this ordinance should pass People who do not choose to smoke shouldn't have to suffer the health issues associated with smoking or even the discomfort of walking through the smoke while in public places. Kind regards, Tammy Zanko, 73 Cromwell Court. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, Ms. Zanko. Next, I have Tom Foraker, 14 Dorset. Tom, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, on this Union County uh, CARES grant, there was a receivable of about 491,000 and appropriated balance was 513,000 about. I'm trying to understand what this really means. Does that, does that mean we just we were eligible to get that money and we just couldn't find a way to use it or they just 
eventually didn't want to give it to us or what? What does this really mean here? I'm going to have Eugenia back me up, but I'm going to tell you um, this was for us. Um, the county is usually a very good partner um, with the Township of Berkeley Heights, but this is one instance that we were very frustrated. Um, we had um, amassed a, a list of things that were um, very related to COVID that we could have used. Um, we repeatedly asked for approval on those items. I think somewhere in September, we really um, pressed for them because it was things like a police car so that our um, A and B squad would be segregated. It was things like uh, uh, DPW equipment. Um, so again, our, our A and B team, because we did segregate the employees. So if team A went down, for example, team B uh, wouldn't have come in contact. And those things um, require a, a great amount of lead time. And we did um, put that list together probably starting in April, repeatedly asked um, for approval um, I'm not entirely sure why we, we didn't get a timely approval, but by the time some of the funds um, were approved, uh, we just didn't have the lead time to order the supplies and, and the equipment that we wanted to. And therefore, uh, by the end of the year, we had to turn back the funding. We were hopeful that um, in certain instances that that would be uh, loosened up, but that wasn't in some, some counties, they extended the deadline beyond, I think it was December 15th last year. Um, that wasn't the case for Union County. They, they did take back any funds that weren't utilized by any municipalities. Liza, do you think I accurately depicted what happened? Yes, and there were some items, if you didn't get them delivered, as the mayor said, in time, like I think there were some- um, December 31st. Right, if we couldn't get them in time, we couldn't use the money. Right, it wasn't, it wasn't as though <clears throat> we could order something and wait a month, two months, 16 months. Goods had to be in hand. Um, so it was um, one of the only times I've been pretty frustrated, but I was pretty frustrated. Um, okay, thank, thank you. Uh, Mayor, I see no other questions. Um, oh, Mayor, sorry, before... sorry, yes. Yeah, yes, I do. I'm sorry, <laughs> Deb, you had your hand up. Deb Varnerin, go ahead. I missed you. Uh, no worries. Um, I just want to add on to what uh, you and the mayor were saying about the um, the CARES Act. Um, I helped with the preparation of the uh, items for REC, and unfortunately, most of the items that uh, that REC even submitted were denied by the county. So um, they they I don't know. I, I feel like it was. Uh, uh, very disappointing that, um, you know, we missed an opportunity to get a lot of items for, you know, the, the mostly we targeted the seniors in town and to be able to offer more programs outside. So that was quite disappointing. Thank you, Devin. Thank you for all your hard work on that. That was, that was tough. And um, okay, I see no other questions. Um, Mayor, could I just quickly note if, if there are residents who are looking to comment on the ordinances for introduction um, later on in the meeting, uh, the citizens hearing would occur after that ordinance would be introduced and then up for debate and vote. So I did want to note if there are residents who wanted to comment on those ordinances for introduction, this would be the time to do so prior to voter discussion on the town member. Uh, yes, yeah, so ordinances um, also count as part of the hearing on the agenda, just to make that clear to everyone. Liza, you mean? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Steven. Thank you, you're good. Okay, in that case, seeing no one else, I move to close the hearing on agenda items only. Second. Any discussion? Roll call? Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Mazaros? Yes. Mr. Barnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. I move resolution one, resolution approving bill is dated September 8, 2021 in the amount of $637,615.69. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Mazaros? Yes. Mr. Barnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. I move resolution number two, resolution consenting to the certification of the 2020 annual audit. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Barnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes.
Okay, I move resolution three, approving the corrective action plan to cover the recommendations in the 2020 annual audit report. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Rahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Barnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. I move on resolution number four, approving the extension of the professional services contract with the Block Environmental Services through December 31st, 2021, in an amount not to exceed $200,000. Second. Second. Any discussion? And this is just to extend uh, the professional contract uh, for the S4 operator of the sewer plant, just to make that clear. Um, any other discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. Move on resolution five, authorizing purchase of certain good and services through the use of regional cooperative purchasing for the year 2021. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Rahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. I move resolution six, authorizing a tax settlement with Adam and Stacy Sarave for the property located at 10 Ford Place. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Rahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. Move resolution seven, authorizing the cancellation of all grant receivables and or grant appropriation reserve balances. Second. Any discussion? And thank you for Bill for clarifying. Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Indubitably. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. I move resolution number eight, resolution authorizing the donation of a 2013 Ford Police Interceptor Utility Vehicle to the Berkeley Heads Volunteer Rescue Squad. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. I just have a question. How many miles? Oh, just gosh. Do you know? <laughs> Probably a lot. It's 100 and something, I thought. 113, maybe? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's just broken in. Perfect for them. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Luckily, they have the ambulance as their first mode of transportation, right? right. Luckily. <laughs> Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. Jean? Oh, sorry. I move resolution nine, authorizing the application of the Green Union County matching grant in the amount of $4,000. So, oh, sorry. I can't, I can't second that. No, okay. Sorry. I seconded. All right. Um, any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Abstain? I move on consent agenda items A through L. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mr. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. Okay, and the two additions. I move on resolution 11, authorizing the filing of a matching Union County Kids Recreation Grant in the amount of 114,539,007. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. I move resolution number 12, resolution accepting the LEAP grant award in the amount of $243 million. Oh, $243,000. I wish. I wish. <laughs> Big, dirty glass. Be great. Be done. <laughs> $243,000. Me too. <laughs> the fund the Union County dispatch. dispatch, Berkeley Heights Emergency Services. <laughs> Any other discussion? Then we wish it's, you know, $2 million, $240,000. Yeah. Yeah. Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. 
Okay. Um, I'm uh, Anna, would you kindly read the first ordinance? Mm -hmm. An ordinance creating a new chapter 9.14 entitled prohibit, prohibit, prohibition of, on smoking in public places to prohibit smoking, vaping, or aerosolizing tobacco products, cannabis products, and electronic cigarettes. Okay. I move that the ordinance as read by the clerk be offered on first reading that September 21st, 2021 be set as the day for public hearing and that the clerk be directed to advertise the same in the Courier News. Okay. Any discussion? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, okay, I'll, so I'll... let's go. I'm going to go in order here of who I saw with your hand first. So Jean, why don't you go first? first. Okay, okay. Um, all right, quickly, yeah. You know, just a little background for people. We passed municipal ordinances really for two primary reasons. If there's not a state law addressing an issue or if we feel there's a need to be more stringent than what the existing state law is. In my opinion, the ban on smoking at the state level has been a very successful law. It's widely known and followed by citizens and it's enforced by law enforcement. You can go see NJSA 26.3D55 and 57. That is where the law states no smoking in public buildings, parks, schools, uh, and fields. In addition, the state laws that govern the no smoking on school grounds, in addition to that, the school district has a really strict policy as part of the student handbook that every student has to sign off on that does not allow smoking or vaping of either tobacco or cannabis products. And that enforcement is handled by the school district. The new cannabis legislation that was recently passed in New Jersey, according to the League of Municipalities, does not permit the smoking or vaping or aerosoling of cannabis items at any place that any other laws prohibit the smoking of tobacco. I reached out to the Board of Ed and to our Assembly Representatives, John Bramick and Nancy Munoz, to make sure that the uh, addition of the cannabis products and the vaping was added to the definition of smoking in the state law, and they confirmed that. So therefore, I feel that this ordinance is not necessary in order to prevent or create a smoke-free zone in our public spaces in Berkeley Heights. What I do feel is necessary is that we need to ask the Rec Commission to place no smoking signs in our parks and fields and we should modify our employee policies so that we don't allow smoking in any of our township vehicles. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jean. And then I think Manny? No, I think that kind of covers it because I had looked up the same ordinance. Um, I went to New Jersey League of Municipalities and looked it up and it, it covers it. Right now, New Jersey SA 2461-52 uh, covers all that as well as the Clean Air Act of 19, what a second, I, smoking ban, here it goes. The Clean Air Act, uh, New Jersey Smoke Free Air Act, which was passed in, I think, 2009. Uh, and that is covered under 26 colon 3D-56 through 19 to 58. So it covers the same thing that's on this resolution. And I, I, I applaud Councilman Young's work for on, on this, but it duplicates an existing, an existing state ordinance. It just puts a more burden on the township. So, okay. That's it. Um, did anybody yeah. else want to speak? Yeah, Mayor, I was just gonna. Um, the the League of Municipalities issued August 26, 2021, a special update that references um, the the Cannabis Regulatory Commission's uh, FAQ as it relates to to cannabis and its cross section and intersection with the New Jersey Smoking Act, as well as their 160 page uh, regulations document, which believe it or not, I read. Um, and again, I, I think, you know, Manny, you kind of uh, nailed it. Uh, it's almost verbatim in what Stephen has proposed. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it is pretty duplicative. Um, and I appreciate to hear kind of places where Stephen believes that it it is adding extra coverage, because I'm, I'm just not seeing the, the need for it myself. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, Stephen? All right, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, a couple of things I would like to note um, that have been raised to my attention since I first introduced this ordinance for discussion back in July. First of all, in my conversations with our chief and the Berkeley Heights Police Department in general, it is their great concern that the state legislation and state statutes as currently construed do not in fact enable the township to adequately enforce the prohibition of smoking marijuana or other cannabis products in any location. Our public school zones, so right outside, whether it's Columbia, Woodruff, Hughes, 
Mountain Park, any of those places, the state statutes are insufficient in their view to protect our children and our families when they are leaving our schools. The state statute is insufficient for the recreational sports fields that our children play on and our families watch their children play on. The state statutes are insufficient for our parks. The state statutes are insufficient if you're walking outside our town building or into our town building, such as our library and our community space. But let's say for the sake of argument that none of that were true. This town has an ordinance on its books, in its statutes, the prohibition of alcohol in all public places. The state has a prohibition on alcohol in these same public places. So the question I would ask my colleagues is, if they believe that this ordinance is an example of government overreach, should they not be proposing we repeal our own ordinances on drinking alcohol? And furthermore, I would argue that if in fact the answer to that is no, they are in fact an agreement that our town should have local ordinances matching the state ones. I would argue that there is no such thing as duplicative when it comes to protecting our children from cannabis smoke when walking out of our schools at the end of the day or their families waiting to pick them up or when they are playing on our fields or in our parks or coming out of our new town building. I don't believe duplicit dupl duplicativeness is a bad thing when it comes to the health and, and well-being of our children and their families. If my colleagues truly believe that this ordinance should not reflect our town's philosophical basis, they can propose repealing our ordinance on alcohol consumption, cigarette smoking, and other things that are already covered by the state. I hope they won't do that. I hope they will reconsider and they will vote to introduce this ordinance tonight. Al, you had your hand up. Yeah, when we uh, last talked about this, I think a couple of, in our last meeting or maybe the meeting before, <clears throat> we talked about the fact that New Jersey was planning, considering a marijuana prohibition. And my biggest concern is that we did in fact have marijuana prohibition. So I'm pleased to hear, although I haven't seen it, and uh, that there is in fact a marijuana prohibition at the state level, but I fully agree with Stephen. That you cannot possibly risk, in my mind, having a person standing in front of a child, smoking marijuana in public, it's just beyond the pale to me. And so I strongly encourage support of this ordinance. This um, is, whether or not there's a state law to stand behind that, I would put a, another layer of protection for the township and its children, and I would encourage support of this ordinance. All right, thank you, Alvaro. Any other discussion? I still, I would like to, do we have any comments from the police directors on this, on this ordinance? Uh, you mean the chief? The chief, yeah. Uh, Liza, is the chief on? I don't see him. No, he is not on. If I recall <laughs> earlier today, he had a family situation and was not in the office. Right, right. Well, and in that case, I would make the following suggestion to my colleagues. If they wish to hear from our police chief, and I, they would be open to reconsidering it at that point, we can vote to introduce the ordinance tonight. If after the Hearing from the police chief, they remain unconvinced. They can vote no and reject the ordinance at the next meeting. Or we can stop the ordinance now and talk to the police chief and see what he says, because my, my searches are coming out just the opposite. You know, the, according to the Consumer and Underage Prohibitions of State Statute 17, colon 30, dash 2.3, uh, E, nothing in the act is intended to permit the smoking, vaping, or aerialization of cannabis items in any place other than the law prohibits the smoking of tobacco. And as for your issue on, on alcohol drinking, I, I applaud that. I agree with you. It's, it's also duplicitous, which does happen. That's why we took care of certain, certain phrases. But that's not what's being introduced here. What's being introduced here is a duplicitous law that matches almost word for word what the state has. So if the, if the police chief feels otherwise, I'd like to hear his opinions on it first before I make a decision. As, as of right now- I actually do have a member of the police force on. I'd like to hear from the chief though. Yeah, it's chief. the chief that's been referenced as informing the position. Yeah. But I don't see a reason to delay. I think we should move forward with introducing it and take the time to, to discuss with the police chief and then just make a decision at our next meeting as to whether or not to adopt. So that's, I want to just, 
I want to just point out when I um, did a little research myself, there are two um, shore communities. I think it's Wildwood or Wildwood Crest and Ocean City um, that over the summer um, did a similar type ban. And they even went as so far as to ban edibles. So in terms of an introduction, I would say, you know, what is the harm in adding an additional layer just to be on the safe side? I hear the argument that it's that you might be duplicating a state law, but you know this has been done over and over again. I mean, even possibly with the bicycle ordinance, I think somebody mentioned a few weeks ago. And we um, changed it. And we took and it out. We, we it. took it right out on the spot. At the end of the day, we're trying to clean up the duplicative. The problem is when you put in these things, then it becomes an administrative job for our clerk and our town attorney yes. as the state laws change, whatever. You have to keep going in and cleaning up your code. And as we are all finding out, our code is, it, it needs a lot of cleaning up. So <laughs> I'm all in fit. Listen, if there's an issue, if you can't enforce the cannabis, then you can't enforce smoking. And why has the police not come to us over the last 10 years and said, we have a problem with people smoking in front of our kids on school grounds. But I, I, that's why I don't believe it. If the teeth aren't there, the teeth aren't there. But in my 10 years of serving, it's never been an issue about smoking. And I've never, and I put it and I've asked and it's, I've never been told there's an issue. So it, if the law is good enough to work with the banning of smoking and they've now modified the definition, it should be good enough and meaty enough to deal with cannabis is all of it, you know, and I just don't want to create more administrative work. Mm -hmm. it's not right. necessary. Well, again, I, I, I want to say that what is the harm when you're talking about something like marijuana smoking in adding an extra layer just to be um, protecting our residents? I, I, yeah, marijuana, I, I, would, I would argue, is, is more offensive just that the smell is intense. And it's, uh, it's just, it was just the opposite of what you said when it was first introduced and you changed your mind. So you changed your mind again or you stick into that that argument? Because when okay. marijuana legislation was being discussed in our town, you said, first off, you said it was a great idea. We'd get tax revenue. I didn't say that. You did. No, you didn't. Didn't. So did Stephen. Both of you guys said it was a good idea for tax revenue. In the beginning, yeah, I said what I said where, where should I say that? Mind, on the first it. discussions, on the first discussions, it was done. And later on, when you when you look through the ordinance, you realize it was a mistake because it was not in place. Alvo, you and I had several discussions and you sent me a, a video, a two hour video showing why it was a good idea. And I sat back and I watched the video for two hours. I said, I, this, I said nothing of the sort, man. I said, keep an open mind, period. And in, in that case, I retract my statement. I apologize. Um, and I'm going like off an topic. And well. I apologize to both of you guys. But we're going off topic. The topic here is still this ordinance. And right. I'd like and to I'd table like it that. until I talk to the police chief, since he was one being referenced right now. Because my research shows it's duplicative. Now, if you're telling me otherwise, I'd like to talk to the chief and then I'll make a decision. I don't want to introduce it yet until, the, until that time. But if you want to hold the vote, it's going to be up to you. Again, I, I just come back to if what is the harm in adding an extra layer? And if folks don't feel comfortable moving forward and introducing it, I get it. I think that we've had, for the most part, a very intelligent, respectful dialogue. And there are going to be times that we just have to agree to disagree. Um, so I thank you all for your opinions and feedback. I, I do think it's important from time to time for people to see us not agree on things or have different perspectives and present different. I think that's healthy, actually. No, um, it is. I, I agree with you. It's just, this is something we're just discussing right now. And since absolutely. it's an introduction of the ordinance, it's a discussion. Um, yeah. And I, I, my research has shown otherwise. Uh, Councilman Yellen is, is telling me something else that I'm not aware of. I'd like to verify that before I introduce something. But it's going to be up to you to make that decision. And then when the vote comes, I'll decide what I feel is otherwise. Because I've had quite a few people call me up on this and tell me that this makes no sense to them. But I have a question for our township attorney before we vote. This is just a Robert's Rules of Order question. In the event that a ordinance is introduced were to be voted down for whatever reason. Can an elected official bring up the same ordinance for a vote at a future meeting? Sure, sure. Yeah, I know it's always, I mean, teachers, yeah you, could, uh, you can handle it procedurally a few different ways. I mean, you could, you could just amend your agenda. Uh, if it were tabled, either one you could add back on later. I mean, there's no prohibition on that. You guys can talk about it, talk to the chief and do what you'd like, so. Thank you, Mr. Christine. Thank you. So are you offering an opinion, Stephen? 
No, I'm I'm simply saying I wanted to make sure that in the event that if this were to result in the ordinance not being introduced tonight by a no vote of the council, that I would be able, or Councilor Garros or someone else in the council would be able to bring up the same ordinance for a vote at a future meeting. And and so, I would. Uh, you don't want to. So you, you don't want to like. Uh, go ahead, Manny. No, I would I would applaud that. Once once I have more information, I've I have no problem. I might even change my vote that's at the future meeting. But right now, I'm I'm letting you know without voting that I have and, some, I have and some as concerns. The mayor, right. And as the mayor said, sometimes we will simply have to agree to disagree. So I believe yeah. we should move forward with the vote and we'll take it from there. Okay. So you want to go forward with the vote. Okay. Let's hear from Detective May first. Is he the only one on uh, from the police yeah. department? Yes. Okay. He you're was on. on. Yeah, there he is. You're unmuted, the uh, detective sergeant. All right. Good evening, council members and mayor. My name is Frank May. As you guys know, I'm the detective sergeant here at the Birth Base Police Department. I'm in here for the chief tonight. Unfortunately, he was unable to get onto the meeting. So I can answer any questions any council members have the best I can. Um, I understand both sides. Uh, I understand both concerns. Uh, we do have this issue with other township ordinances as well, though. We have disorderly conduct township ordinances, which is also state statutes for. And, you know, there's other examples that we could come up with. So I was just wondering if you guys have any questions for me as far as a law enforcement perspective. So, and, and I, I, without looking at the municipal code, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, uh, to me, this really, this ordinance resonated with me because of where we are with policy and cannabis and um, uh, you know, listen, right now it's decriminalized, but it's not necessarily legal uh, to have marijuana. And is this something that is useful to law enforcement as we're in this in-between stage? I guess is my question. So marijuana is decriminalized at this point if you are in possession of less than six ounces of it. So that, you know, that's where we are with marijuana at this point. I, you know, the ordinance is we have to enforce what we have locally. So I don't see why an extra layer of protection would be an issue. And we do have other ordinances that are covered by state statutes that are already in place. Okay. Thank you very much for that, officer. So, so I think this question, can I just ask? Uh, yes, go ahead, Gene. Uh, um, Detective May, is there something in the state statute right now that, that would prohibit you from enforcing the rules? Like, do you need this? What in the state statute can't you, is not helping you? Where's the problem? To my, to my knowledge, as far as I read the state statutes, there is nothing that can enforce it, but there's also other issues like disorderly conduct. We have township, township ordinances for that, where we would have no problems enforcing that with the state statutes. So okay. um, th that's where we're at from the law enforcement perspective. We do have other examples of this situation. We agree, the code's a mess. Not saying what's right and what's wrong. I'm just saying there are other examples of that. Thank you. So I, I'm still confused. Um, so uh, uh, Detective May, uh, if there is a state law prohibiting the smoking of cannabis in a school, on school property, and somebody is consuming marijuana, are you not able to enforce that law? Yes, we are We are able to enforce it under the, the state statutes. To my knowledge, we are. Okay. Uh, I was just giving other examples where we do have ordinances. There's state laws that we could enforce and we also do have ordinances for those as well. Thank you. I, I understand that sometimes there's duplicative law and, and sometimes there is not duplicative law. Um, my question is merely, are you able to enforce the laws of the state of New Jersey, of which is the New Jersey smoking ban, which also covers the smoking of cannabis? Mm -hmm. Yes, we would be able to for enforce that. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Um. I'm conflicted between tabling and going forward. Um, I don't see a reason. Well, I don't see a reason not to introduce. Uh, it's just it, in my mind, this is this is an important thing to the township. 
I don't think we should run the risk. It just depend on the state, uh, to the state laws to represent what is very important to us. In my mind, I think we should stipulate and, and, and emphasize that this matters to first and nice. And I have no problem passing a resolution that says we support our 100% behind the state law. I just have an issue with adding our code and making so. an administrative burden on the code. I think this is simply one of those areas where you will have to agree to disagree. I do believe it's important that all of us be on the record tonight as to where we stand on this ordinance and on the question that I raised at the beginning, and we'll take it from there. I would call for the vote, Madam Mayor. I'm going to have to make a motion. Um, so, I, Councilman Yellen, are you making a motion? No, I was. I was uh, saying to the mayor, I would. Uh, I think we've discussed the issue, and I would ask her if she could call for the roll. Well, that's fine. I think there's someone has to make make a motion to introduce. I think Steve oh, did it already. Yeah, he did he? Okay. yeah I think we're in we're in the discussion portion of it. Yep. Okay. So I guess we've gone through the process. So yeah, we'll we'll do a roll call. Mrs. Brahimai. No. Mr. Kudo. I I I'm I'm still conflicted. I don't think it's a layer of protection. And I'm sorry, I'm discussing it right now. It's just about time. So I, was, I will still say no. And if it says no and it gets reintroduced, I might change my mind. Mrs. Kingsley? No. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? No. Mr. Yellen? Yes. OK, next ordinance. Anyone want to read the ordinance? Please. An ordinance of the Township of Berkeley Heights vacating a portion of Sherman Avenue in the Township of Berkeley Heights. Okay, I move that the ordinance is read by the clerk, be offered on first reading, that September 21st, 2021 be set as the day for public hearing, and the clerk be directed to advertise same in the Courier News. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Just, just a real quick, with, Go ahead, with the part on Sherman Avenue being vacated, is that curve piece? I think Chris or Liza could probably. Because I know there's a lot going back and forth on that. So I just want to make yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah, there were two different items. Yeah. Uh, okay, then that's the other piece. Okay, no problem. Chris, can you just confirm which one it is? I'm sorry, I don't have my. I have the light agenda yeah. ahead of me. <clears throat> the map is on the ordinance. It's back. It has a, a meets and bounds description, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, was, I was looking for it the says a lot in black right on the ordinance, um, which will clarify. Uh, they, it just it doesn't mark off on the ordinance. It says ordinance yeah. of the township Berkeley Heights vacating a portion of Sherman Avenue. It does not have a block and lot on it. Block okay. seven. So, so, block the, meets bounds, the meets and bounds is, is attached, though. Yeah, the meets and bounds is attached. Yeah, it's that was there. So that's it's, what you would refer to. It's block 702, lot 17. Yep. Block 17. Yeah. So just, we just attach, I guess Matt, when he prepared this, just attach the meets and bounds, which is entirely acceptable. So you can do it that way, it's fine. Ah, okay, um, lot it'll 17. Give you the exact, it'll give you the exact outline too, if you were a surveyor, you would, it would mean something to you, so. Yeah, no, I just that we didn't have any survey with that. I just wanted to see if there was a survey. I have block. So Manny, on page 48 of the big packet, which I didn't print out, it's in the PDF format. I'm sure it's the same. Yeah, no, you. I'm looking at it here. There's, there's, yeah. there's some parking spaces on that piece that we're vacating. I can't tell. I don't think so. I think it's the space in between. Yeah, that's that's why it's it's confusing to me. I know the it, I know we've added that in, but I've gone back and forth on this a few times and still doesn't isn't clear to me. You look at the uh, resolution that we passed in November of last year. The map is a little clearer. It's actually mm -hmm. shaded. Identifying there's a little arrow in the in the map that's at the end of the ordinance pointing to the section. Yeah, and it's uh, like eleven thousand square feet, right? Yeah, yeah point two oh four yeah. point two something eight, eleven thousand two hundred and three feet. According to the map, and I'm looking at the map, seven oh two lot seventeen to survey. Um that has Electric riser and six parking spaces. I just question which where are those parking spaces are. What are we vacating? Are those our parking spaces? I think those were never real parking. Remember we went through this before, and those aren't real parking spaces. 
Yeah. No, maybe it was part of the resolution for the thing we discussed. That, that right. They, they were never there. They really don't exist. If you go yeah, back there, I drove back there. They're not there. They uh, could okay. be banked. They could be banked, which is not yeah. uncommon. Right. Yeah. yeah. And this also, the survey also says proposed road vacation. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. They did. They never got, they never existed. Let's check riser. Yeah. Okay. Um, that makes sense. By Bowman Consulting. Because mm -hmm. yeah, I, I was... I was on for an hour, an hour trying to figure out with Google Maps and the survey maps and the township maps and everything else trying to picture this and it just didn't didn't make sense. Okay, if it's a proposal, then it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions or uh, discussion? Nope. Okay. Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Bronnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. Okay, citizens hearing, Alvaro? I move to open the citizen hearing. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Varnerin? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. And the same instructions apply for the citizen hearing that I recited earlier. Um, the citizens hearing is now open. Liza, any we have a couple of the, in the hopper, so I'll just okay. take an order that people okay. request in. Uh, first, Ritu Chandra, 30 Sawmill. Ritu, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay. Ritu, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Devaney and members of the Town Council. My name is Ritu Chandra, and I've been a resident of Berkeley Heights for the last 13 years. During that time, Columbia Park has been a hub of my daily life. Besides walking my dog there almost every day, I used to push my son in his stroller as an infant. When he was older, endless hours were spent on its playground, and as he gained independence and insisted on going alone, I spent a lot of time in the bushes watching from afar. In that time frame, I met some of the best people of this community. The other dog owners, fellow parents, and other moms hiding in the bushes just like me. It is no exaggeration to say that some of my best memories of living in Berkeley Heights are at Columbia Park. On July 17, 2021, that changed. I was verbally abused, threatened, and called a racial slur, which while I do not enjoy saying, for the record, I was called a chink bitch. Fortunately, I was able to remain calm and record most of the incident. In my 13 years in this community, I have never encountered a situation like this. And I think it speaks volumes on the changing climate of the country and its attitude towards Asian peoples. While I want to applaud the Berkeley Heights police for their compassion in ident and for identifying and charging the perpetrator, I'm disappointed with the conduct of municipal prosecutor, Michael Mitzner. On August 30th, I met with Michael Mitzner. At no point during our discussion was the legal process explained to me. I didn't know what to expect from the first meeting. I do not know what to expect from our next meeting on October 7th. Furthermore, Mr. Mitzner had, not, ha, had clearly not read any of the information on the case thoroughly, nor had he watched the video or the video statements of me and the eyewitness, who is another Berkeley Heights resident, Christina Knuth. I begged several times during the meeting that he simply watched the video of the incident, which is less than 30 seconds long, and he never did. I was told that this wasn't so bad because the racial slur directed at me didn't really apply to my ethnicity, as if that made it less ugly or less threatening. When I insisted upon being spoken to with more respect, he became angry. At no point did I feel I was speaking to someone who was trying to be helpful. Based on my experience, I have serious concerns as to whether he will appropriately, inv appropriately investigate and address this matter. If this matter is not appropriately addressed, I fear that it reflects, reflects that our community endorses racially harassing behavior. In addition to my gratitude to, to the police, I have also been touched by the expressions of support from the community. Unfortunately, that does not apply to most of the town leadership, which is very disappointing. 
Amongst the people here today, only Jeff Varnerin, Gene Kingsley, and Manuel Kuto have reached out to offer their support and discuss how they might be able to help. And I would like to publicly acknowledge and thank them. I would like to wrap up with three requests. First, the mayor and town council, as Mr. Mitner's, excuse me, Mr. Mitzner's employers, insist that he review all the evidence of the case before it is settled and that he be made to acknowledge the seriousness of racism in our community. Second, Berkeley Heights should develop and implement a protocol for how to handle incidents of racial hatred, including a point of contact for, for victims to be heard. I put in endless hours since my meeting with Ms. Mr. Mitzner last week, numerous unreturned emails, phone calls, and wild goose chases in an effort to figure out how to get help. And all the time I put in has been to make sure that an incident of racism did not go unaddressed in our legal system. I hope there is never another victim in our community but it would be naive to hope without planning. They may not have the time, resources, or language skills to ensure their rights as a victim are taken seriously. I want to ask you to make sure there's a victim rights advocate at the municipal level to make sure their voices are heard. Lastly, as part of this protocol, I would ask that town leadership reach out to express concern to any victim of such an incident. Public rallies and lawn signs are not enough when, when excuse me, when real victims go ignored. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and uh, for your suggestions. I think they're very good ones. Mr. Corsini, do you, you and I had a discussion um, yesterday about uh, the appropriateness of governing body um, and could you just please address that? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, may I... Any current court, court cases? Yeah, so uh, you know, for matters that are pending before the municipal court, I think it, you know it's best that the governing body not speak on any specific matter of the facts or the procedure. Uh, I think what the resident has said is she's offered some some you know overarching comments. Uh, my suggestion would be that the council take them under advisement, consider them. Um, but I wouldn't comment any you know until the matter is resolved before the before the municipal court judge. Uh, I always would say it's best not to comment on the facts or the procedure of it. Um, that's, a, that's sort of a different province. But as to the, the broad brush stuff, I just think it's you can obviously take it under advisement. Uh, I would say that's what I would suggest. Thank you, Mr. Corsini, I agree with that. Thank you. Angie, can I ask one quick question? Is there something on the state level that, not state, on the county level that, that we can tap into? There is a uh, victim's rights advocacy component to the Union County Prosecutor's Office. Um, so not speaking specifically to this case, but just generally, um, unfortunately, and I know that you all have been through this situation, I have had um, many times where there have been people impacted by uh, an ongoing investigation or um, a court case. And unfortunately, I like to hug everybody and sometimes you just can't reach out because you could jeopardize that investigation. You can jeopardize somebody's court case. Um, but typically, not again, not speaking to this specifically, because I know Mr. Corsini has advised not to, but typically the police department uh, drop the charges. It then goes to the Union County Prosecutor's Office. They then decide which charges um, to pursue. Um, sometimes I think it, it, it gets pursued at the county level or sometimes it then goes to the municipal level. Does that sound about right? Uh, that, that's, that's accurate. To, uh, that is 100% accurate, yes. And they have a county advocacy office um, and they do work with victims. Um, so uh, absolutely, that's, that's a good point, Manny. Appreciate that. Okay, Mayor. Uh, next we have Michael Terpstra, 30 Sawmill. Um, Michael, you can unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. I only had one follow-up question, which was um, Mr. Corsini said, this goes before a municipal judge. I think the concern is that it's settled without ever going before a municipal judge. Uh, I, I would believe, and I don't have, you know, I haven't seen the, the case jacket on this, but a judge would have to endorse the prosecutor's recommendation, whatever that recommendation is. Um, so I don't think that's accurate. Um, it's not like a civil case where the judge doesn't have to sign off on the settlement in most cases. Um, if it's, if there are charges that have been sent out by the Union County prosecutor, and as I say, I don't have the full jacket, but from what I understand, the judge would have to sign off on a dismissal. 
So I don't think that, I, I mean, I, while, while that would be accurate in civil court, I don't think it's accurate here. In fact, I'm sure it's not accurate here. So that will be done in a public hearing. I believe typically, yeah. I mean, I, I don't practice in the municipal courts, but but from what I've seen there, from this perspective as a as a township and or borough attorney, yeah, that's what I've always observed, and I think that's in the law. Thank you. Mr. The judge has to agree. The judge has to. I mean, the, judge, the prosecutor just can't say, "Oh, well, we want to, you know, drop these charges." The judge has to say, "We agree." I agree. But with the editorial one. So, Mr. Corsini, if I can, actually, no. If there are members of public waiting to speak, I'll wait. Um, next, we have Renee Shalhoub, uh, thir also of Thirty Sawmill. Uh, Renee, you can uh, unmute yourself. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, hi. Yeah, I'm sorry. Bad connection. Um, I'm here to reinforce what Ritu has requested. Um, and I would also like to add, as a concerned citizen, um, what is the township of Berkeley Heights going to do as a whole to combat racism in their community? Um, in our community. So I would really advise you all to take this incident seriously, as seriously as you can, as seriously as it needs to be taken, um, and really make this the last time it happens in Berkeley Heights. Um, and um, I'm sure that if you are interested, um, I can give you a lot of resources towards anti-racism trainings that everyone can undergo, um, because we know that white supremacy plays a role in our society. So please take Ritu's please seriously. This is a real, a real serious issue. Um, and I would just like to add as a point of reference, Ritu is a civil servant. She volunteers for multiple organizations. She helped people get vaccinated, makes you know vaccine appointments. She's helped numerous nonprofits in the area provide food for people in need. So go that extra mile, do what you need to do and do the right thing for Ritu and for everyone else that can't fight back the way that she is. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Okay. Madam Mayor, if, if I may. Uh, yes, quickly, because uh, I think Liza's yeah. saying we have a number of people who want to speak and I don't want to uh, keep- And, I, and then in that case, I'll wait till the residents have spoken. I, I if it's a quick comment, Stephen, we can sure work it in. Do you have a quick comment? I, it can wait till the end. Okay. Okay. Next, we have Ron Weinger. Ron, um, if you can give your address and go unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Ronald Weinger, 196 Lawrence Drive in Berkeley Heights. Uh, I'd like to commend the administration for, after decades of neglect, its interest in the preservation and restoration of the property known as the Latell Lord Farmstead. However, this interest interest has been marred by lack of transparency and by decisions and actions which are leading to the opposite of the desired result. Grants have been applied for, yet no one knows for what nor what has been granted. Under the Dig for Dinosaurs fundraiser, over $5,000 was raised, but no one knows what the funds were or will be used, used except for in broad generalities. One of the results of the Dig was the destruction of 147 square feet of the 19th century farmhouse meeting room floor foundation. Lost forever is the information about how that floor was constructed and why it collapsed. Information specifically related to the historical interest aspects of the building. Along with that, the with that destruction, an external gap large enough for animals to enter the building was created at the doorway to the room and it was not covered. The town has been notified of damage to the roofs of two outbuildings, yet there's no evidence of repairs. Years ago, the town was informed that a hundred foot pine tree posed a threat to the farmhouse, yet nothing has been done. Not even an acknowledgement was, acknowledgement was presented. There are rumors that the town will spend an undetermined amount of money for external storage of the farmhouse museum artifacts, items owned by the Historical Society of Berkeley Heights, not the town, when putting money into the building repairs Repairs that are needed anyway would result in long-term free storage. The town does not appear to be even interested in discussing this idea. Since this is a town project, I would like to know when the town would demonstrate the responsibility, accountability, and capability the project requires. 
Ron, does that conclude your remarks? Or did we lose you? I think perhaps we lost him or he concluded no. his remarks. Yes, no. I th they muted me. Oh, okay, okay, just making sure, just making sure. Okay, Liza, I think you wanted to address some of um, Ron's remarks? Sure, I can. And uh, yes, we are finally making a lot of strides toward rehabilitating uh, the Latell Lord House. And if Ron, if you have any questions, you can always ask. I know you have been going in there to chronicle the artifacts and whatnot with a historical society, the archaeology work that was just done. That was the dig around the house. These are historical archaeologists. They're professionals in this, in this field. Um, and yes, any money, as noted here in these meetings before, any money raised specifically for the Latell Lord restoration goes into the Latell Lord Trust, which can only be used for uh, restoration and preservation and rehabilitation efforts for the house. And I did get permission from the historical architects that we hired to oversee this job to repair the roof and put new gutters and new downspouts on. So the DPW is going to be, be doing that as well. So these issues are all being addressed and we're excited that we're finally able to um, do work on this project and we're moving at a, at a decent pace. So if you have any other questions, Ron, you can email me and ask, you have my email address. Yeah, so what about the floor that was just destroyed in the meeting room and the door that has a gap in it large enough for a raccoon to enter the building? That was never discussed. That was never even noticed by the town, yet the town has been notified. And the roof repairs belong uh, on the uh, what's known as the summer kitchen. There were tiles on the top that are coming off. Yes. And the, uh, um, the uh, red, uh, the stone uh, root cellar building. There were uh, shingles on the roof of that that are loose or appear to be loose from a distance. No one could go up there and chat because that's not permitted, but... Uh, the DPW, that is on their list of things to do. Obviously, that got pushed back a little bit with the storm and the storm damage, but that is on their list of things to do, and they've already gone to assess it, so they're going to take care of that. And I will tell them about the hole that the animals are going through. But nobody's ever said anything until just now. Now, this was brought up weeks ago. Okay, Ron, if you, acknowledgement if you, at the time. Okay, Ron, could you could you reach out? Time. Can you reach out to Liza, Ron, please, right, via email, so you can just you know finish up this conversation. Okay, I, and Liza is telling me there's a couple more people that want to speak tonight. So if you could do that for me, I'd really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Anthony Pergola, one twenty Sherbrooke. Anthony, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you very much, Liza. Um, having watched the video that uh, Ms. Chandra pointed out, um, I, I found it to be a very counter indicative of my experience in Berkeley Heights. But unfortunately, um, it's the kind of thing that uh, reflects very poorly on our town. And, um, you know, I want to make sure that the town doesn't exacerbate the incident um, by not paying attention uh, to it from the prosecutorial standpoint. Um, I think I'm more disturbed by the report that the prosecutor refused to review the video or refused to review the video in advance or during the meeting with Ms. Chandra. I think it's incumbent on the town council to think about are we well represented in this area? Um, I understand that the uh, town prosecutor, municipal prosecutor has been practicing in this area since 1977, uh, well before cell phone videos and well before incidents like this would have gotten um, the kind of attention that it should get today. Um, so putting aside Mr. Corsini's um, advice about speaking to a specific case or, or not to a specific case, which you're welcome to uh, take that advice or not take that advice. Um, you're welcome to speak to the case uh, regardless, but, but putting aside the specific case, you know, I do think some, some hard thought needs to be put in to the kind of representation that the town gets um, from the prosecutor and uh, how it reflects on the town. Um, we'll be watching this situation and 
you know, we'll, we'll sh many of us um, are sure to speak again. But, uh, you know, that's that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Anthony. Very thoughtful. Thank you. Okay, next we have Deb Varnerin. Uh, Deb, I forgot your house number. You can say it again for the record, please. 20 Wardle. Go ahead, Debbie. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I just, I just want to make a comment. Um, listening to Ritu's uh, story and also watching the video that was um, posted on Facebook, um, I'm appalled at the behavior and actually... Um, I'm a little concerned that the um, municipal prosecutor, I guess is what his title is, did not look at that video closer because when I look at it, it appears to me that there is something that that woman takes out of her back pocket. So I don't know if it's a weapon. It's definitely not a leash. So it's disappointing that the prosecutor did not look at the video to see that this could have been something else that, that has gone wrong um, and that could have could have gone wrong. Um, I also just want to say, um, like having an advocate or something, I, I think that, you know, and then hearing Stephen with this ordinance that is duplicate of a state ordinance being on the last meeting where the majority of the council said that it wasn't needed as a rec commission member. I had suggested going in front of the rec commission and talking about this since it involves parks and fields. Mr. Yellen did none of it. He did not talk to the rec commission. He didn't talk to the rec director. You know, he obviously didn't have any further conversations with his council members and went against everything that, that they said and just introduced this ordinance. So I guess I would like to say that perhaps this, this meeting is is a learning for for everyone as to what we should dedicate resources and taxpayer money to instead of trying to duplicate ordinances and and from what i'm hearing create additional administrative work that taxpayers are paying why don't we do something useful and have a community advocate trained so that instead of just washing this under the bridge have somebody that's there to speak to them and you know maybe that's the diversity council maybe that's the the truth and racial healing committee but i'm sure with all these different committees, there is somebody that we could send these people to, to get advice, to even just get sympathy. I mean, I, it's, it's very disappointing. It's very disappointing that, that we live in a community like this. And, you know, this was just completely ignored by the prosecutor. I, I mean, we, we can definitely, I think, do a little bit better. And again, spend our, our time, energy and, and money on more useful things for the community. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Debbie. I just want to say that Stephen did take the time to send a letter to the entire council that the present the ordinance that he proposed so that it didn't take us by surprise. When? When did he do that? Last week. Last week? Yeah. That's the plan that we've adopted in the council is that the whoever is bringing forth an ordinance shares it with the council in advance. I mean, that's the, that, Maybe you know, the process over. needs to be improved because it's obviously not working. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liza, next resident. Yes, uh, Ayana Joseph. Ayana, if you could just unmute and uh, go ahead. And sorry, say your address for the record. Hi, sorry about that. I'm on two Zooms. I apologize. 205 Gallinson. Um, I just wanted to um, follow up with Ritu and um, Renee and uh, Anthony Pergola and also um, Debbie Varnon in regards to this situation that occurred in our town. Um, outside of the legal issues and the, the, legal, the legality of it, what are we going to do as a community to make sure that um, people in this town know and understand that this is not acceptable? Can you hear me or you cannot? No, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I just want to know, I want to know what the council, what, what, 
what what are we gonna do? What are you guys gonna do? What are we gonna do? Like this needs to have action immediately. I so that's my question. Okay. Uh, and I think this is a perfect place to bring up the Truth and Racial Healing uh, Committee and the ordinance that we're trying to finalize and, and get passed. And we've been talking about the mission statement and this group being an umbrella um, for these types of things. And I can certainly see where an advocate um, would fit in nicely to um, this kind of situation. I know that there've been a couple of incidents um, that have occurred. I won't speak to specifics again, where um, you know information has been shared with that committee um, or people have asked or, or we've offered for people to come forward to that committee and, and have a conversation. Um, so I think that if we just expand on, on, on what we're doing, I think that an advocate is a really good um, addition to that committee and a great idea. So we'll, we'll hopefully the committee will have some ideas on how we can execute. And what, you know, in 2018, um, we passed a resolution that's, you know, called hate has no home. And I think that is a resolution that we need to be putting on the January 1st agenda every year so that it is front and center and out there. And I would recommend that we pull that resolution and put it out again next, you know, at our next meeting to just keep reminding the public that these aren't just words, we got to walk our own talk. Um, and I, I would recommend it come on the next meeting and we make it a January 1st resolution every year. So it's front and center with the public. I think that's a great idea, but in addition to that, what are we going to do about this? Like she's not, right, Ritu is not the first resident that has no, gone through not. something like that. And this is unfortunate and something needs to happen. There needs to be some type, there needs to be some type of conversation. And I think this is something that needs to be led by the community. So I'm, I'm asking what action is the town council and the mayor going to take? Because this needs, something needs to happen. This is, this is ridiculous. Like every two or three years, we have a major issue or something like this happening. What type, like what example are we setting at, at, as the most welcoming town in New Jersey if we're, if we're not doing anything, if we're not putting any action behind the words? So that's just, I mean, that's pretty much what I have to say about it. I, I'd like to know by the next meeting, what are we going to do? And I say we as a community, I'm not just putting it on you guys, but I'm putting it out there to you guys to lead this effort. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Ayana, I think in, a, in a, I mean, a partnership with the Diversity Council is always um, a good thing, but I think also there are really specific things that we have been trying to work on with the Truth and Racial Healing um, Committee. One is diversity training for our uh, municipal employees. Um, another is to be uh, thoughtful about, in, you know, being inclusive, um, and and that might mean or what we're trying to execute is a tab on our website um, that showcases all the uh, diversity groups or places where um, we could get better education about diversity, whether it's the diversity council, the YMCA, um, and there's probably five or six other, probably ten other groups um, that aren't at top of mind right now. Uh, another one is uh, in terms of sustainable New Jersey. Um, really honing in on uh, diversity in our workforce, being mindful of that diversity on our boards, diversity on our committees, diver diversity on our commissions, making sure that, uh, sorry, that was a bug, um, making sure that our, our community and our municipal government and extensions of, of our local government reflect our community. So those are the things that we've been trying to work on um, with that group specifically. But if you have other ideas or things that you think we should be doing better or more of, I'd love to hear from you. And Madam Mayor, if I may quickly add to that, um, Councilman Varnard and myself as uh, council liaisons to the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Task Force, have been working on an ordinance, uh, which once we get a final run by with the task force members, we should be able to present to the governing body to make it a formal committee with the ability to begin acting concretely on these areas that we all know have to be acted on. Um, I certainly agree with you about the need for a additional position for an advocate of this kind uh, to be added to that discussion, the inclusion in the, in the uh, ordinance. And I look forward to talking with Councilman Barnerin and the other members of the task force uh, to see how we can incorporate that. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Liza, next resident, please. And next we have Rick Bath, uh, 69 Orchard. Uh, Rick, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Rick Bath 69 Orchard Lane. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council for your time today. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about the road conditions on Orchard Lane. Um, as a matter of background, 
I know there's long-term projects and process about the water um, and we've had a lot of issues, but we are very frustrated here on the street. Um, we've had long-term problems with the roads. We've had a couple of patches. This last storm popped all the patches out. So we now have craters on the road uh, around a turn and we're fearful that we're gonna to have to wait until the long-term fix to get this resolved. And right now it, it's pretty dangerous um, and it's really bad. So, um, you know, I don't wanna complicate any of the long-term project or, you know, I know things like that can't get accelerated, but if you guys can do something to just help us in the short term, get another round of patches until this long-term project happens, it, it'd be greatly appreciated. Um, you know, we're, we've had this long-term issue, uh, so we probably have more water issues and problems than other parts of the town, I get that, but, um, you know, we're pretty last in line when it comes to road repair. There's a lot of repairs going on out there, um, and, you know, your help would be greatly appreciated. So Rick, I know that you emailed me and we exchanged um, emails. I did talk to our township engineer, uh, Tom Salfaro, and I did talk to Director Graziano about uh, doing some temporary patches just so we can get through the next uh, few weeks. Um, one of the, as I mentioned to you, one of the things that we're hopeful about is getting the federal emergency declaration um, by the president for Union County. And one of the specific things, um, in addition to uh, you know direct FEMA cleanup for, for residents and businesses is road repair um, as a result of the storm. And I, I think that from what I saw in doing the damage assessment that um, Orchard was certainly uh, mm. impacted greatly by Ida. Um, so that's something that we're, we're going to keep an eye on. And um, I've also asked the, the township engineer to, to do some brainstorming um, that maybe we can find a way um, if the federal declaration doesn't come through, but we're hopeful that it, that it does, that we might be able to do uh, some of the engineering work or some of the road work <clears throat> ahead of um, some of the other drainage um, um, uh, work. I don't know if you know the full story, but uh, the council dedicated $100,000 towards uh, engineering uh, for the West Side drainage uh, study last year, another 100,000 this year, um, we wrote $750,000 uh, federal appropriation through Senator Booker's office uh, and uh, Congressman Malinowski. We were one of 10 projects uh, that made the final round and approval in the House for about 250. Um, to take that next step of engineering, we're told is somewhere in the $300,000 range. So we need uh, some additional assistance to that um, to help with that as well. Uh, and then we've been working with the infrastructure bank to get a 50% you know, of the project could be done at a 0% loan. Uh, in addition to hopefully, I mean, mm. we have to have a dialogue about this as, a, as an entire governing body, but we do have uh, the American Recovery Program funds um, that we are or to get shortly. Um, so hopeful that some part of that will, will allow us uh, to do some early work on Orchard, uh, Orchard Lane. So I appreciate all that a great deal. Um, seriously, I know getting a big ball like that up a hill is, is a huge project. We have strategic issues here, and I think that's all awesome. Um, it's just, you know, in the short term, we, you know, we're going to need a few patches quickly until this is fixed. And, you know, I apologize for some of the frustration that came out in my email, but, you know, it's it's, it's been a lot of years here where, you know, it's been a little tough. So um, I, I, I super appreciate all the work you're doing. Um, you know, I'm generally aware of the progress on the bigger project. I just feared, you know, by the time that's done, it's a little longer down the line. And, and right now we've got some some really big problems. So well, we'll, the, we'll definitely get the patches done as soon as they they the, so the DPW is going to do a, a small bulk pickup for the storm uh, victims and then a chipping program. And then we could definitely get the patching done. Um, what we're trying to look at is, if, is there a way to at least just resurface orchard? We can't reconstruct. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to, to go in 
Uh, you know, I get that. In the budget process, Angie, we had talked about, could we do like a partial, like not the full, whatever, if it's 10 inches or eight inches, like could we do three or four? And we've talked, I followed up with Tom Sofaro, the engineer several times. So he was supposed to be looking that as we go out to do the whole bidding of all the other road paving that was going on. And that was of course, prior to the road, eroding even further, but this has been in the works and was talked about the entire governing body as part of the budget this year to see what we could do. Right. I mean, can you give us an estimate, Jean? Because that is that street is really, really bad. And I agree with Rick. And Rick, I understand your frustration because I've walked on that road and it's pretty bad. And I'm concerned that uh, by the time that, you know, the drainage study is done and everything else, I mean, how many, we might be two to three years down the road. I'm not quite sure of the timing. Maybe we can get, if we talk to Tom Sotaro and get some sort of an estimate as far as, you know, how much it would cost to do some, some paving in there in the meantime. Yeah. Something that makes sense. Okay, good feedback. Uh, Liza, next resident. Uh, yes, we have Ramya Kasturi. Ramya, you can, um, yep, you unmuted. Just give your address, please, for the record. Okay, sure. Hi, this is Ramya Kasturi, and my address is 86 Cromwell Court. Um, thanks for taking, I have one question and one comment, so thanks for taking them both. Um, I just want to build upon what Mr. P Pergola and Ms. Farnerin said um, about the attorney. And my question specifically is, what is Ms. Chandra's recourse and what is our recourse as a township if we feel that our municipal prosecutor is not zealously advocating as he should be on our behalf? I'm particularly disturbed to hear the description of their meeting. Um, there might even be some ethical issues here as it pertains to his comment. Oh, it's not a big deal because it's actually a misdirected racial slur. Um, so before we even talk about you know, it getting to the municipal judge, what is our recourse as it relates to this prosecutor's action or inaction, I should say, um, and his behavior? And then my comment is, I just wanna echo prior comments, um, Renee's and Ayana's. I understand, um, <laughs> I understand that it's not a good idea to comment on the facts of the case itself, but I do think that silence sends the wrong message. So thank you for answering my question, hopefully, and listening to my comment. Thank you, Ramya. I, I mean, Mr. Corsini, as it relates to her her first or her first question, the second was a comment. What recourse uh, do we have? I mean, essentially, if we don't feel he zealously uh, is doing his job, and again, I won't get, I won't speak to specific incidences. I think you'll admonish me not to. Um, obviously, he doesn't get reappointed. Uh, that's exactly it, Mayor. Uh, I think that the governing body does a good job. Certainly, speaking from personal experience this last winter, uh, going over all the professionals um, that you guys hire. Um, I think I had four interviews, you know, so, and that's, the governing body does a great job, uh, both the administration and the governing body does a great job vetting their professionals, and you'll vet this one in four months. So, um, based on what your observations are, and, and all your employees are, you know, vetted anyway. So, uh, that's the recourse, quite frankly. You said it, you said it exactly right, Mayor. Just to clarify, Mr. Corsini, so the municipal prosecutor as well as the municipal defender are appointed to an annual term at the reorganization meeting of the town government. Is that correct? Yes, unless otherwise provided by statute. And one of those actually is the judge. All professional services are for a term of one year. Judge is three. Um, but, and there are a couple others that have exceptions, but that's not relevant for the prosecutor and for the public defender. Um, one year terms. And his, I, I'm assuming he's not, he's on the same, I mean, not, they don't have to be, but they're all on, you know, I think you guys have all your professionals on the same calendar for January. Um, there's no law that requires that, but I think you guys do. So, so January, yeah, um, one year terms. Is it possible to, um, to have a second prosecutor uh, watch or supervise or inspect what this prosecutor's done in this case? Is that totally out of question? Can you hear me all right? And it's Alvaro talking, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. I, I can hear you, Alvaro. Go on. I was just saying, is, that, is there, uh, to the question that, uh, that Ron that just asked, is that what alternative would we have if, that, if the prosecutor's not doing his or her job, um, and, and obviously this case may not repeat immediately, 
Um, but it is a serious case and, and not something that we want to ignore or disregard. Is there anything at all that we can do procedurally, at least to supervise and make sure that the job's being done right? So, um, as I understand it, as I recall from um, from your reorg, you just have the one prosecutor. Um, some towns have two. Berkeley Heights is of the size where you would typically just have one. Um, that's your guy. Um, you know, that's your guy for the year. Um, you'd evaluate him. You could always appoint a second one as a backup in the um, in your reorg policy decision you guys can make. Um, but headed it until you know your reorg in January, you got you got one guy. Um, he's the guy. So um, so yeah, that's the most I could say about that. We 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 wouldn't have the opportunity to like appoint a special prosecutor or something like that, just specific for this case. That's a good question, Councilman Varner. And, um, I would say for any case of any sort you could appoint a special prosecutor. Um, some towns have them for like DWIs. They split it out a certain way. Um, that's probably the most common that I've seen. And that also would be a one year term. And as I say, it doesn't have to be coterminous with the calendar year. So yeah, the most common circumstance I've seen is like you have a DWI prosecutor um, and he comes, he'll come in to do those cases, he or she will come in, to come in for those cases. So just so speaking in the broad brush, so I want to keep it that way. Um, if you had a, a type or a classification of sometimes with, um, uh, property maintenance too as a special attorney. So you have a type or classification of offense that you wanted to have a special prosecutor for as long as it was contemplated in the budget, you could do that, sure. It is done. I mean, you, frankly, it's a little small to have more than one prosecutor, but you could. I mean, there's no reason you couldn't. Could you get us a, a definite uh, view on that? Um, obviously, I understand you're, you're speaking in general, but- oh, well, So th that is my definite, you can have more than one prosecutor for specific types of cases. That is, I don't need to do any research on that. That's done every day in New Jersey. Um, I, so I was yeah. referring specifically to cases involving civil rights or other related issues. Towns have that authority and I, I would like to see that. Yeah, I would say, I would, I would say 90% yes. Um, I'll just make sure there's not a statutory carve out. I'd be shocked if there was one. Um, it just doesn't seem like the kind of case that would be carved out. Um, I mean, there's no prohibition to having six prosecutors handling six different kinds of dockets. Uh, it would be wasteful <laughs> of your money, but this is a, an issue, obviously, as are some of the other ones, DWIs and, and property maintenance come to mind, you know, where there is a level of expertise, where there is a priority made. And I'll look at that to see if there's a carve out, Councilman Yellen, but uh, you can pretty much, you know, that's, I think, something you could do. So if you wanted to, you have to have a budget allocation. Yeah, you, you know, they'll go through all the normal steps. You got to do the, you know, Eugenia would tell you, you got to go through all the paperwork. But as a as a legal matter, I see, you know, virtually no problem with that. Thank you. Okay, next we have Rob English, 60 Rutgers. Rob, you can um, unmute yourself and go ahead. And Fantastic. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you so much for the time. Um, I'm here in support of uh, Reed to Chandra. I'm a, a lifelong resident of Berkeley Heights, you know, and this story just broke my heart. So I'll keep this short because obviously what you're seeing here is a theme, right? You're seeing citizens coming together in support of each other and saying enough is enough. Uh, and, you know, in my opinion, I think the, the prosecutor feels that this is a, a silly issue um, and is, is looking at it that way. And I can tell you it's not. Right. So I implore all of you, you know, to to speak to the prosecutor, do what we can to make sure that, you know, um, the support of the Berkeley Police Department who did their job and looked at all the evidence and, and you know, realized that, you know, it, you know, they could make the arrest because there was issues there for that. So really, you know, what I see here is, you know, so a prosecutor, you know, not taking the time to look at the evidence and really everything that was you know, the investigation that took place. Uh, so kudos to the Berkeley Heights Police Department. You know, please, please, let's support this. You know, and, and to, you know, to, to uh, Ayana's point, right? What can we do? We can take this matter seriously and press charges because the ultimate goal is to you know to thwart other people from doing this in the future. And if we look, if and if people see that we do take these matters seriously, you know, hopefully we can prevent and have less and less of these in the future. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Rob. If, if I may, Mayor, just briefly, sure. I think it's important to stress. 
uh, that the matter is still pending. Um, you know, the pro whatever the prosecutor may or may not have said, I have no facts, won't comment on it. Um, but there is some steps of, of due process that will be gone through. And, uh, you know, there, I think you have to get to that point before you really evaluate what has happened. Because you still have, I mean, there's another, there's another court hearing in this matter. And, you know, there'll be, there'll be as with any court case, there'll be time to put on the proofs, um, to, to have, you know, witnesses and all that. And I really do stress, I think that comments should be restrained until the matter has gone to the end. I, and I think at the end, then you can have a very long discussion about it. Yeah, but and Chris, I appreciate that. But yeah. also a lot of this is based on, you know, the conversation, what we're hearing about the conversation that took place, right? And the fact that he wouldn't even look at it. The fact that he's saying that this was an isolated incident. It was, shouldn't, shouldn't affect you because you, you're not Asian. All of those comments that have been made, right? And are on the, you know, on the record right now, you know, we, that's the reason we want to make sure that we're having this conversation tonight, period. And also, if it, once it's over, you know, as the governing body evaluates its uh, options for next year for all positions, including mine, um, you can call your professionals back in and ask them questions about things that they did during the year. You know, I, I, I mean, that's important to realize, too. So there is some, some matter of, uh, of it's, um, you know, halfway through the process, I think, once you get to the end, the governing body will have a, a, the ability to really evaluate it and take more definitive action. I, you know, just, I would caution getting too far ahead of, I would caution each member of the governing body to get too far ahead of themselves until the matter has reached its conclusion. Thank you for listening. Uh, next, you. we have Courtney Bolden, 260 Mountain Ave. Courtney, go ahead. You can unmute. Hi, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I came here where I attended this meeting in support of Ritu. Um, I saw the video and was absolutely appalled by what happened. I think like many of us here, and I'm really happy to see so many um, other members of the town who feel about it like I do, that that is that we are not people who accept that. Um, but I am um, a little bit concerned about what I've heard about the prosecutor not um, you know, being willing to even look at this or not taking it seriously because um, honestly, it, it's not a surprise at all um, for us. Our neighbor has harassed us for years, including yelling racial epithets and the Berkeley Heights Police Department has been out to our house many, many times over the past few years. And, um, you know, they didn't take action until basically the neighbor threatened to take a hit out on my husband in front of them um, in the summer of 2020. And since then, uh, I mean, it, it just seems like nobody really thinks this is a big deal. The prosecutor hasn't done anything. Um, the, the, I don't know, the judge, they've had it on hold for a year and don't seem at all concerned about it. And so I wonder if there's a pattern with this prosecutor or if, or if they have an outlook on these things that um, you know they don't value them as worth the time. So um, I definitely would want to add my voice to the idea of a special prosecutor or a second eye on these things. Um, because I, I don't know that they're being handled um, to the, you know, as well as they could be at this point. All right, thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, next, we have Bruce Mustashi, 60 Spring Home. Bruce, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Good evening, Council Mayor. Um, we all know how much I love speaking about these things, but I, I, I'm, I'm attending this and speaking on behalf of and support of RITU. Um, I a, want to thank Deb Varnran. I want to agree with Rob English. I want to also thank Alvaro uh, for trying to come up with solutions because for most of this, what I'm hearing is, hey, Ritu, tough luck. We can't offer you advice. We can't help you. So maybe we'll get lucky and kick, kick the process and not, and not re retain the prosecutor, okay? That's not what, what Ritu is, seems to be looking for. She wants a solution and she wants it now and she deserves it. And as we always talk about um, things like this, it certainly is a ra racial incident. She also was physically threatened. Forget about the woman who was pulling out of her out of her pocket or not pulling out of her pocket. She came in over the dog. Okay, so for the prosecutor to ignore all of this, and for our township body, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for to basically just put her out on a raft and say, well, that's the way it is, tough luck. I'd like to hear who is responsible for disciplining the prosecutor, who's the prosecutor's boss, 
Who does Ritu turn to to get someone else assigned to this case? The county, the state, the municipality? There must be some recourse, and I'm not hearing anybody saying, oh, Ritu, we're going to look into this and find out what the best steps are for you to get justice, because this is not just about racism. It certainly is a big piece of it, but it's also about someone getting attacked by someone and threatened physically in, a pu in the public domain, in a public park in Berkeley Heights. And to me, that's completely, completely unacceptable. And, oh, I encourage this, and I encourage this body to seek out and help Reed to seek out some answers to what her next step is. It can't just be put yourself and put your case in the hands of a prosecutor who clearly has illustrated that he doesn't give a darn. So I implore the council, um, I support Ritu wholeheartedly. We are better than this and we need to be better than this. This is completely unacceptable. And that's all I have to say. I hope, I hope that uh, members of the body and the township that can pass along advice on Ritu about where to go, who to speak to. Chris, maybe you can speak to who Ritu can go to. Who well, is responsible for Michael, for the, for the prosecutor's performance. Somebody has to be, I've been at the town for this for years that we have zero process for residents who are dissatisfied with the performance of, of public servants, public employees, excuse me. There's no recourse, there's no discipline and nothing's been changed. It's been three years. I went at it hard for two years to try to get some sort of system in place and it fell on deaf ears. Well, guess what now, folks? Now it's come to roost. So I do, I realize there's been a lot going on. You're all volunteers. Nobody's getting rich here. We're all stretched thin, but this is really truly an important matter for the township to consider. And there needs to be some sort of hierarchy and someone that can intervene on, with Ritu on her behalf for this. I don't accept that there's no path and I understand that government bodies have separation of what they can and cannot do, i.e. vis-a-vis Board of Ed and Town Council. I understand that, okay? But we need to do better than this. So, so just speaking very generally, if, if I may, Mayor, um, I do think it, it's very important that the public realize that the council does have oversight along with the administration. Um, that oversight period is actually not that far away in the calendar. Um, uh, there will be the ability to to um, evaluate and if necessary discipline. Uh, Why not evaluate now? Why are we waiting? I mean, is there I don't. I have, I have to look at the. I have to look at the contract you have with the prosecutor. I, I would need more information. Wait four months. Well, how come nobody's asking me to for more information? Wouldn't that be more appropriate yeah. action from the township? And that's the sort of thing that I'd like to ask this body to consider and see what they can do to help out here. I know that there's more that can be done there. We all do. And you're good people. And you're well principled. So please, let's figure out some level of assistance or guidance for Ritu. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate that. Liza, you're on mute. Sorry, it's so you don't hear my kids yelling at me in the background. Uh, Jill Chawala, 29 Ferndale. Go ahead, Jill, you can unmute. Jill? Okay, I'll maybe come back to her. Um, okay, David, I'm sorry if I get the last name. David Ardrich, 354 Riverbend. Hi, uh, thank you for hearing me, uh, Mayor DeBaney and Council. Um, I just wanted to second what uh, what Bruce and Rob said. Um, I think that there needs to be some uh, accountability for what actions we take as a town to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, letting this go, I was actually pretty unimpressed and disappointed that uh, the council didn't didn't engage with Ritu. Immediately, I'm glad that it was the minority of the council 
uh, and that there were some folks who did, but, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I do wanna see some accountability and I don't wanna let this go. Uh, so I thank you for your time on that. Um, I will take up the issue of the, the, the drainage. I don't think that this is the right opportunity, uh, the right time for that. I think that the, uh, um, the, the, the issue for Ritu is much more important now. So um, if you wouldn't mind, please do contact me and I will, I will discuss that with you. This is the third time that I'm digging out four feet of water out of my basement. Um, yet I'm still here focused on making sure that we have the right type of attitude in this town um, so that we keep it the Berkeley Heights that I moved here for. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Janice McLean. Janice, uh, go ahead. Can you just say your address, please, for the record? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Janice McLean, 48 Klein Place uh, South in, of course, Berkeley Heights. Um, so I heard, um, I apologize. I missed Ritu's, um, I missed what Ritu had to say to the council because I, I couldn't log in till late. But um, I heard, uh, Mayor DeBaney and Jean talk about an ordinance that we uh, passed in 18. I think it was, hate has no home here. It was a racial, it dealt with racial matters. But I guess my question is, um, and, and maybe you've answered this already, I don't know, but the, I'm not sure, I miss why the prosecutor didn't pursue this but or or hasn't yet pursued it but i guess my question is is there an ordinance of some kind that could be crafted to direct the prosecutor to pursue these matters in a particular way every single time if it's racial bias if it's racially motivated could we as a municipality put some direction give them some direction to that that will always be followed in these matters. Is that possible? So Janice, just to clarify, this is an ongoing court case. I, th I think that you used the word dismissed, right? I mean, Chris, I mean, you agree with me that this it's- Right, right. So I, I, think, I understand it's, right, it, has, right. it has not okay. been resolved, but, but I'm just talking about in the future, as these matters come up, is there, is there a way that we could say this always needs to be handled? It, all, it always needs attention possibly it needs to be discussed with you or with the um, whatever committee is decided upon racial healing or diversity. Um, and I am just wondering if the if the prosecutor can be given a set of directions, a set of, of, of you know, a way to handle this every time so that he doesn't have as much discretion as he does now or she. Are you talking about, I'm sorry, Janice, as far as if I understand you correct, yeah, correctly, are you talking about introducing some type of an ordinance that, you know, would direct the prosecutor to handle these cases as they come in? Exactly. And I'm not sure it's possible, but it seems like it might be an idea if it is possible. So, so I, I do, you know, I've, I've listened to the discussion and spoken about it with both uh, Liza and the mayor earlier today. I do have some thoughts on this. I can render an opinion on that possibility and others to the council. Uh, but I really do think we need to kind of rein in the conversation here. This is a pending municipal court matter. Um, you, you may be very pleased with the result, or you may not be. Um, and I think we should really wait until it's done to get too deep into this, Mayor, if I may say so. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of good discussion, and I'm very sympathetic to it. And I, I think this is a, a process that, that can go, you know, a variety of different positive routes. Um, but I do really think that we should uh, let the process play out in court. I think that you could prejudice this matter and, and hurt um, Ritu's case, quite frankly. Um, what, uh, quick question for you, Chris. From a legal point of view, how sure. long do you think, uh, how long do you think, uh, you know, it's going to take before we actually have a, dis you know, we have a decision? And I mean, and I know you can't predict that because we're dealing with the courts, but just, you know, just as a, you know, as a matter of, uh, you know, general, I mean, generally speaking, as a matter of time, in other words. So even a well-run municipal court is very, very difficult to predict. It just is. Um, so again, Tiana, I, I don't know um, that I could give you anything super accurate. Um, but I mean, a matter of a hearing or two more perhaps, but it could drag longer. Um, a lot of it, I mean, there's also an evidentiary burden. I mean, Richie sounds like she's got some, some really good evidence um, potentially. 
and that that should be you know presented and, and all that you know the, the processes as with any of your municipal court cases you should go through and as to how long that takes i'd be just guessing okay um i'm gonna try jill chihuahua jill are you able to hear me and unmute Okay, I actually don't think she's on anymore. Okay, um, Mira Rao. Mira, can you please um, give your address? Yes, hi everybody. Um, my address is 24 Greenbrook Road, Berkeley Heights. Um, so as I understand it, um, this case has not been brought by Ritu, but it is a case that the police department, in, in fact, Detective Negro, is um, leveling or putting forward against the person who perpetrated this hate crime. And Ritu has been named as the victim. Is that right? So it's, it's a case that the uh, township and the police department is actually pursuing. So Ritu herself is a part of it, but is cited as the victim. So my question was, does that change anything in terms of uh, procedures and so on? Because it's now the police department that has the case against a, a resident. Mayor, do you want me to? Yeah, yes, please. Okay, um, so I, that, well, I've never seen like the, the, the case documents and if the township wants me to review them, I will. But um, that does sound typical. And uh, but when I talked to the, both Mayor and Liza today, the process does sound like it played out as it typically does, goes to the county, come back, comes back down, goes before the prosecutor. Um, I mean, I don't think it changes anything from, from the municipal case. I, I do, as I've listened to the comments, it, there, there are circumstances, and this is, you know, as those ask, um, you know, the things, that, the options that, that Ritu has. Um, I mean, you can also, I mean, I, as I would tell any resident with any issue, you can also consult um, private counsel and see if there's a civil action too. I don't know, and I, I don't know that there is or isn't, and I, but, but for those looking for further action to take, um, you, it is not unusual to see companion uh, civil cases in these matters, but I can't say one way or another if there is one, I wanna stress that, but if you, you know, there's many competent lawyers in New Jersey who handle these you know, types of cases like this, and that's a remedy that could be sought also. I have a follow-up uh, comment. I'm sure it should be quite possible and not very difficult to actually come up with a set of guidelines that we can, as a township, generate so that Ritu's scenario, which she described, that she had absolutely no idea what was expected of her, what the next steps were, we could definitely come up with a document and I'll volunteer to write it saying that if this happens, these are the steps to follow and these are likely what is gonna happen next and so on. Because when you're just a resident and you have no clue about how the whole system works, you're left in the dark. And there, it, there might be some of this information available online, but you know, it's buried somewhere and it's not easily accessible. So I think uh, just as a town and as a community, if we generate these kinds of clarifying documents, it would be very helpful. Amir, I, I entirely agree with you and I'd be happy to talk with you about it. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks. Mayor, we have um, Steve Corellis, 35 Sycamore. Steve, go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me make sure I got video and audio. There we go. Now I'd like to go back to the non-controversial <clears throat> non portion of the meeting regarding the smoking prohibition ordinance. Um, there's a brief comment. I was at a conference session when this topic first came up and I had concerns that I voiced at the time. I didn't see any response to the feedback at that session in the proposed ordinance for introduction. And you know, since, as of when I read it a few days ago, and but since that conference session, and since I have to deal with state statutes, it's one of my occupational hazards, I did my own research and I have to agree with the comments tonight that state law is highly effective in, in covering these issues. I, I will say the, the one positive note from the time spent thus far 
is that we do now have a heightened awareness of the subject and are in a better position to act should we start seeing a problem that actually needs fixing. Um, there comes a time to start rehashing the same discussion and better spend our time on the more pressing issues facing our community. And I'm hoping we can do that when it comes to this issue of uh, the smoking issue. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And um, next we have Larry Schwartz, 88 Lenape. Hi, I'll try to make comments and I, I'm not really speaking about the facts of the case. I do want to make some comments in support of Ritu. I did actually see the video that Ritu referred to uh, and it's, it's unambiguous that the other woman in the video made racial and derogatory comments. And I feel strongly that our town's leadership when made aware of such infractions has to take a zero tolerance threshold. Anything other than that is to be complicit. Additionally, the woman in that video also made threatening and menacing comments. She actually charged at Ritu and wanted to escalate this to a physical altercation. All of this is very troubling. And Ritu indicated that the lawyer hadn't even reviewed the facts or the video. And I'm not a lawyer, but it's unequivocal that a lawyer should at a minimum review all of the facts of a case and advocate as a fiduciary to their client. I'd like to see stronger advocacy for issues such as these, race, discrimination, hatred. And I think residents need to be reminded that this behavior won't be tolerated in Berkeley Heights. And if it is true that the prosecutor has not reviewed the facts of this case, then someone in a position of authority or with I think we lost Larry. Yeah, I think so. We lost you. Larry? Larry? Yeah. Let's give it a minute. Larry? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, there we go. We hear you now, yeah. I'm going to try to get to a closer signal. Did you hear anything? You're okay now. We heard you. We heard most of you. I, I believe we heard most of what you said. You were. He, he was mentioning that somebody of authority. Authority, right. Position of authority. Yeah. Right. I just think somebody with a position of authority or supervisory authority should question the fact that uh, Ritu saying that this lawyer has not reviewed the facts of the case or looked at the video yet has some responsibility to represent her in the town in this matter. I'm not sure who has that authority or supervisory authority, but that seems like something that should be questioned and pushed forward. Did we lose Larry again? I don't think so. Okay, that might've been his final comment. All right, if you could still hear us, thank you, Larry. And. Um, Mayor, I see no other questions. Got them all. So, seeing no one, I move to close the citizens' hearing. Second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Anna, you're on mute. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yes. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Mazaros? Yes. Mr. Ronneran? Yes. So Yellen. Yes. Okay. I move to open the Township Council reports. Okay, very good. Gentiana? I'm gonna keep this very brief. Um, I just hope that everybody had a, a great summer. It's been a little quiet since end of August in here. People like to go on vacation and there is not a lot going on. But anyway, I just like to uh, you know, welcome all our uh, students to our new year and then wish everybody, all our Berkeley had students a great school year, considering, you know, we had COVID last year and it's been a very hard year. I'm looking forward to having the best year for our uh, all of our students. Uh, I hope everybody made it okay through the uh, remains of Ida storm. I know we had some damages here at the township building. I just also wanted to remind the residents of uh, that it is restaurant month here in Berkeley Heights. And uh, these businesses have suffered during COVID and also for a lack of, uh, because of a lack of, uh, you know, having the, uh, uh, the, the staff actually the supporting staff to actually keep the businesses open so please go out there and uh, grab a bite to eat and support these local businesses there is prices and uh, that's why the uh, 
you know, we have some great local businesses here and uh, just would be great to actually support them because I know a lot of them are, have actually suffered quite a few losses. And uh, that's about it. Okay, great. Thank you. Manny? Okay, uh, EDC meets next next this month, later on this month. We didn't have a meeting last month. Um, Unification Committee will be meeting very shortly. And uh, again, piggybacking off of Gentiana's uh, restaurant month. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone post on Facebook and Instagram and everything else. There's a lovely video Liza released that showed uh, us sitting at a table outside of a restaurant, telling people what kind of passports they really needed to get stamped and what prize are available. So with that, on to the next person. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that was a great video, guys. Well done, Jean. All right, I, I won't be quite as brief, sorry. Uh, let's see, communication committee. Uh, we have been, I, we've been working on a September e-newsletter. Uh, we anticipate it will be distributed hopefully by the end of this week, Friday. Uh, the committee is currently reaching out to all of the various committees of the council to see how we can continue to support them and promote their initiatives. In addition, the committee is looking to begin the website upgrade this fall. Uh, we are still looking for volunteers to help serve on this committee. So while we have a lot of people on the phone, we are really looking for residents that are interested and have communication skills. Uh, if interested, see the township website and complete the volunteer committee application. Uh, the next committee meeting for communications is September 15th. Um, as everybody said, restaurant month is in progress. Want to thank the committee for all of their efforts to get this wonderful event organized. Um, this year, we have 21 businesses participating with several new restaurants. Uh, in addition, a number of local restaurants have stepped up a business, sorry, not restaurants, to get, sponsor the gift cards that the diners can win if they bring their passports to be stamped at participating restaurants. We are very grateful for these businesses support and for um, Berkeley Heights Business and Civics doing the outreach to help us. So if you don't have your passport, go to experiencebh.com, print out your passport and start to dine around the world locally. I'm sure Manny already has more you know, stamps than all of us, but we've, we've got to try to catch up. Uh, next meeting is September 14th. Planning board was canceled tonight. The next meeting is Wednesday, September 22nd uh, at 7.30. Um, it is back to school season or the most wonderful time of the year for us parents. Um, and it's so exciting that we can now walk along the sidewalks on Plainfield Avenue because they are completed. Huge shout out to the to the contractor because we thought that would go on in September. Um, can't wait to see a lot of kids walking and putting those sidewalks to use. Uh, the Safe Routes to School grant is due October 14th. We are working with the school superintendent, the PTOs, in addition to the town engineer and police to make sure that we will have a strong grant application this year. Uh, I just want to thank our DPW sewer police fire and rescue for all they did to help all of the residents with Tropical Storm Ida. Uh, I've lived here 25 years and I I've never seen rain like that. Um, so I just want to encourage the residents to fill out the storm drain assessment. If they didn't see it come out, I'm sure Liza will address it, but we need to get the federal funds. So please, everybody do your part and don't forget to put your degrees outside starting Friday. Lastly, just want to wish everyone that celebrates Rosh Hashanah a very happy and healthy new year. That's it. Great. Thank you, Jean. Alvaro? Thank you. Um, so the uh, Senior Affairs Committee met again on August 25th. Most of the discussion centered on programming for Berkeley Heights TV, which we hope to accomplish by recording township events and programs. Uh, one of the things we wanted to include that we may not be able to at this point is the Berkeley Heights PD uh, presentation on fraud protection, which was quickly scheduled and delivered on August 26th after Summit Health had to cancel their presentation over rising COVID rates. Uh, we also discussed continuing or had continuing discussion regarding what we are now calling the senior information fair to be held at the township multipurpose room, COVID conditions permitting, and tentatively set for mid-October, building TCO permitting. Uh, the idea is to have various organizations in town share the services they offer to seniors and seniors to have an opportunity to sign up for things like communications, activities, clubs, etc. Autumn Lakes has gracious, graciously offered to provide refreshments. So hopefully we can pull this thing off sometime this fall. The Grants Committee also met on August 25th. Susan Pope submitted for the Preserve Union County Grant for Little Lord, the Town Lord, I should say. Um, and I'm working on a T-Mobile grant for Town Park, another, another shot on it. The Environmental Commission met last night and included in the agenda a presentation from and feedback to DJ Chen of Phillips Priest, our township uh, planner. On the master plan, one concept that was discussed at length is a vision to better leverage Sherman, Sherman Avenue as a venue for downtown events and activities, um, which I thought would be fascinating looking forward to the master plan. 
The community garden is uh, seeking to raise funds and will partner with the Rotary Club and plans to purchase food for the bee colony this, for this winter so they can survive. I reported on a quick analysis I undertook with Kim Diamond regarding conversion of township streetlights to wall LED. My conclusion was that we are better off waiting for the BPU to mandate that conversion costs be included in utility rates, since that will likely happen before, long before our own conversion costs have been recovered. Lastly, um, I, I want to express my admiration for the patience, perseverance, and resilience of those township residents hard hit by the horrible rains we experienced last week. I uh, had a chance to walk in, 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 in high rubber boots through Riverbend area last Saturday, and I was stunned at the water levels I encountered and the number of yards really have become lakeside property. I, was, uh, I also uh, have to admit I was impressed by the residents I ran into, in particular one um, who I met, Lisa Kerrigan, was also clad in rubber boots, was wading to her house through almost a foot of water with her store purchases in hand because she didn't want to add to the wake, pushing more water into uh, neighbors' basements. Her own house, thankfully, was spared, um, I, but I just had to admire her for, um, for persistence um, and, and consideration. Um, I do wish all of those residents and everyone impacted by the rains early relief from the damages that they've experienced and my heartfelt prayers that we don't see that again here or anywhere for many years to come. It was truly frightening and obviously a, a, a horrible effect on many people. Okay, thank you, Alvaro Jeff. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Angie. Uh, tonight, I'm going to dispense with my um, regular report and address serious matters, especially given how our uh, our community has come out in support of a of a neighbor uh, a neighbor in, in need today. We saw that during the citizens hearing, so I think this is uh, as timely as as possible. So, since entering office in January of 21, nine months ago, my goal has been to listen. Along the journey, I have become aware of serious acts of politicization within the administration, governing body, and committees that are here to serve us all. In fact, members of this governing body have chosen to point fingers, or should I say use the political party one is associated with as excuses for the inability to get work done. First couple times I witnessed this behavior, I pointed it out and asked for it to not be done again. While a select few have adjusted their behaviors, in my opinion, this is becoming more and more common with others. Recently, during a committee meeting that is nonpartisan, fellow town council member lashed out at my contrary point of view on an issue and indicated it was because of my political party affiliation. Further, it has become increasingly difficult to work with some of my colleagues due to their lack of common business practices, such as lengthy delays in responding or non-responsiveness to emails, phone calls, or failing to, in good faith, negotiate with colleagues. These types of behaviors erode the trust between the governing body and the community. And frankly, we're, we're simply better than this. I could have chosen to use my council report as an opportunity to personally attack or shame those responsible for such behavior, but I won't. Instead, I chose to do research and determine a more productive way to address the issue. I found that many organizations have implemented civility pledges to restore collaboration and decorum into American politics and communities. Tonight, I'm introducing a civility pledge that I expect as elected officials we all commit to. Mayor and fellow town council members, I ask for us all to pledge to focus on facts when speaking about each other, set aside our personal differences and political agendas to seek understanding as a first step on all issues related to the town's business. Respond to communications from colleagues within 24 hours to at least acknowledge receipt or indicate that you will respond. Constantly strive to highlight areas of alignment versus disparity. Remain solutions and forward focus during good faith negotiations. Openly solicit broad stakeholder feedback and leverage a diverse set of viewpoints and matters germane to the governing body. Talk to colleagues first before complaining or accusing them of misbehavior publicly. Leave personal agendas at the door to achieve an independent and objective perspective for the entire community. I'll ask Anna if I can leave a signed copy of the pledge with her so that all can sign it. And in closing, and to quote Tony Gaskins Jr., never speak from a place of hate, jealousy, anger, or insecurity. Evaluate your words before you let them leave your lips. Sometimes it's best to be quiet. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Stephen? 
Um, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, I have a report on the Historic Preservation Committee. Uh, the Historic Preservation Committee met on September 2nd. The archaeological work on the Littell Lord Museum has been completed. The next step will be structural strengthening of the lower levels. The good news is that we do not have to move to a more in-depth analysis of the findings, which would have cost us a lot more. We are waiting for the archaeological firm's report. Following that, the project will be turned over to the historic architecture firm to start putting together construction and bidding documents. The committee will be launching a new fundraising drive to raise another $5,000 from the community. Uh, so please stay tuned for more. Uh, that is the uh, Star Preservation Committee report. Um, I want to uh, wish, the, uh, Shana Tova, wish to say Shana Tova, uh, sweet new year uh, to all members of the Jewish community here in Berkeley Heights, including my own family. Uh, I hope that the year 5,782 uh, will bring us all health and happiness. Uh, finally, just uh, which were not part of my remarks prepared tonight. I just want to say to all the residents who have come here to speak tonight, I have heard you. We have all heard you. We all feel it. We all sense it. We will all do all the things that can be done for the good of the community. We will all seek to do. And I think I can speak for all of us when I say that. I grew up in this town. I know what it feels like to be targeted because I am different. It's painful. It hurts. It leaves scars. We as a community need to move to a place where no one has to grow up and no one lives here having to feel those scars. And that is something I am committed to. I know it is something every one of us on this governing body is committed to. And that goes along with civility, along with respect, along with good faith and goodwill. And I believe all of us are committed to doing so. And any resident of the community uh, who looking for us to do these things, know that my door is always open. And I'm sure for all of us, our ears are always open as well. That's all. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Stephen. Administration reports, my report. Um, I just want to welcome back uh, all those who went to uh, all day in-person school today. It was truly wonderful to feel some normalcy. Uh, many of our committees are coming back online in September, so we'll have more updates as the month goes along. Uh, the township is asking Berkeley Heights residents whose homes suffered damage from Tropical Storm Ida and its aftermath to fill out a quick damage assessment form that is due no later than 11 a.m. this Friday, September 10th. Uh, the survey is to ensure that we have all of the locations that have been damaged documented to submit to the state of New Jersey and the, the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, this is not an application for personal assistance. We're still waiting on that federal declaration, fingers crossed but rather to help the township receive federal funding through FEMA so we can better assist residents in Ida's wake. Also, Berkeley Heights residents most affected by the aftermath of Tropical Storm Ida can leave storm-related household debris uh, only at the curb beginning Friday, September 10th through Friday, September 17th. Um, I've been in contact with Director Graziano. We have been trying to figure out the best program that we can for people most impacted. Um, the DPW crews will come and pick up the items after 2.30 uh, during the week. Uh, the director and I will evaluate the need to extend the program past September 17 based on volume. But I ask everyone, please note, this is not a typical bulk uh, pickup program. This is only for people that have been impacted by the storm. I please ask you to respect that and your neighbors who really need the service. Once that the Ida debris collection program is completed, we will then start a townwide shipping program uh, residents can put tree limbs that fell as a result of Ida by the curb beginning at any time, um, but they will not be picked up until at least September 17th, perhaps later, depending on, again, uh, the additional need for uh, more bulk day pickup days. Um, at the township's request, Union County will be spraying for mosquitoes tomorrow night. It was suspended last night because there was an issue with the misting machine. Um, this will take place from 7 p.m. To, uh, to midnight. Uh, streets that are included presently, and I think this is going to be a, a more uh, as uh, we, we see tomorrow, Chaucer, Riverbend, Kuntz, Mount Carmel, River Road, Garfield Street, Passaic, Grant, Camp Town, uh, and we have also requested and they've added Mead and Columbia as well, but again I think there'll be more streets added uh, tomorrow, so we'll, Liza will keep you posted on that on the Township website. Finally, I wanna thank the police department, the fire department, the DPW, the sewer department, and the rescue squad for your tireless efforts. 
Uh, not many know how many sleepless hours you all spent to keep us safe, making numerous rescues and making sure that our residents uh, have what they need. Um, and I just too want to informally address um, as far as I can that we have heard you, we have heard all the residents, um, we have heard the, the person who made the statement today, um, as I've noted previously, as the appropriate authority of the police department, we have done everything within our authority and we will continue to do so without getting into specifics. It has been one of the harder tasks of the last two and a half, three years, being the mayor, as if you know me well, I do like to hug people, I like to, to reach out to them, I like to sympathize and empathize with them when they're going through a hard time. It is very hard and I've had numerous situations where there's been an investigation or something um, like a court case and you simply cannot reach out because you don't wanna jeopardize what's going on, be accused of witness issues or other things. So I'll say that very gener generically, but you have been heard since day one. And with that, I'll conclude my report. Liza. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to encourage all residents to please sign up for our website news alerts. The website is berkeleyheights.gov slash sign up. Uh, seems to be one crisis after another uh, the past two years. <laughs> so um, that's really the best place to get information on what's going on with the township in terms of services, um, surveys, and whatnot. Um, we have a September 11th ceremony um, this Saturday, September 11th at 8.30 a.m. at the 911 Park on Park Avenue, um, commemorating the anniversary um, of, of September 11th. So please join us there. Um, road paving, we have projects on Windsor, to Fairfax and Tudor, the Glenside Ave drainage project is starting soon. We have additional road projects um, going on in the next couple of months. Please check our website, berkeleyheights.gov for those. Um, also the transit parking lot update. We want to, we want to, um, our current transit lot that is on one side that's on the old YMCA side of the railroad tracks. We are going to be paving that, but we're now waiting for the new parking lot and our new municipal area where the big dirt is right now to be done before we close down that lot on the other side of the tracks for paving because we wanna make sure that we have adequate space for any people that are going back to work um, into the city or elsewhere commuting by train sometime soon. So that's the update on the transit lot. Um, municipal complex update, we are getting rid of what we hope is our last pile of bad dirt, that small remaining pile there. So that's very exciting. Um, and those are the main updates that we have this week. Excellent. Thank you, Liz. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Then one more thing, because I forgot all about it. Uh, for the 19th, there is a race through Berkeley Heights, the Berkeley Heights 5K. It's being, uh, it's, a, it's a run, 24th BH5K Run with Keith. You can uh, sign up online. Look around Facebook, you'll see notices going through your emails if you've run before, but it's on September 19th and you can sign up now. And thank, that'll you for, be yeah, thank you for mentioning, Manny. Uh, my fiance and I will both be there. Uh, Perfect. Uh, I'll be hobbling along this year. So yeah. <laughs> I sign up every I'll, year. And you I'll be happy can, if I'm able to hobble. You'll, you'll hobble with me. We'll both hobble along. <laughs> um, with that, I move to close the Township Council reports. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. Mr. Kudo? Yay. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Medeiros? Yes. Mr. Ronneran? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. Okay, whereas the provisions of the Open Public Meeting Act, NJSA 10 colon 4 dash 1, expressly provide that a public body may move into executive session and exclude the public from that portion of the meeting in which the public body discusses any of the nine areas set forth in NJSA 10 colon 4 dash 12b. And whereas the Township Council of the Township of Berkeley Heights has determined it necessary to move into exec executive session to discuss the following subjects, all of which are included in the aforesaid exceptions. One, attorney client privilege, Sherman Avenue right away. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Township Council of the Township of Berkeley Heights that it does hereby move into executive session pursuant to NJSA 10.4-12B to discuss the aforesaid matters. It's further resolved that the aforesaid discussions shall be made public either at the public meeting following said executive session or at such time as any litigated or personal matters are concluded or upon conclusion of any negotiations or related discussions or as otherwise specified. It's resolved this resolution shall take effect pursuant to law September 8th, 2021. Second. Second. Discussion? Roll call? Mrs. Brahimai? Yes. 
Mr. Kudo? Yay. Mrs. Kingsley? Yes. Mr. Maderos? Yes. Mr. Ronneran? Yes. Mr. Yellen? Yes. Uh, we will now go into executive session and no further action will be taken. We'll only come back to adjourn for this evening. Uh, give me a few moments to open up my Zoom. See you all in a few minutes. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good night. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night.
I'm unmuted. Four, are we good? I think we're good. I think we're good. All think motion we're good. to John. Oh wait, we need Anna. Oh wait, Anna, oh sorry. Not too excited. Why not, me too. Alvaro. Alvaro, you gotta unmute. Anna, there's Anna. <laughs> well, Alvaro. Hey, All Anna. Right. All right, now I'll motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. All, all in favor? Aye. All right. Have a good night, Gene. Right. Have a great have a night. Night. Have a good night. Let's hope we have no storm. Uh, Gene.